We'll wrap up our discussion of the respiratory system by again looking at some homeostatic imbalances. Like always with these that we look at at the end of the chapter, I want you to have the big picture of what they are, the basics of the signs and symptoms of what causes it, and of course the effective treatments if there are any. Now I certainly don't want you worrying about what percent of the population or how many cases are found each year. Uh, but because this is a, a very important topic, I certainly want you to be aware of many of these respiratory disorders that you're probably going to encounter if you are going into any type of health-related profession. So we'll begin with asthma, which is a disorder that's characterized by airway inflammation and hypersensitivity to a variety of stimuli and also airway obstruction. It's usually at least partially reversible, either spontaneously or with treatment. It affects about 3 to 5 percent of the U.S. population, and it's more common in children than adults, so sometimes children are said to outgrow their asthma. Airway obstruction can be due to, small, to uh, the smooth muscle spasm in the wall of the smaller bronchi and bronchioles, or edema of the mucus uh, in the airways, or increasing that mucus secretion. It can just be that there's damage to the epithelial linings of the airway. People that have asthma typically react to concentrations of allergens that are too low for most people to even notice. Sometimes the trigger is an allergen, allergen like pollen or dust mites or mold or even a particular food. Other common triggers include emotional upset or aspirin or certain sulfites sulfites such as those used in wine and beer, exercise, uh, breathing in cold air or cigarette smoke. Regardless of the trigger, the symptoms of asthma are pretty straightforward. You have the difficulty breathing, coughing, wheezing, chest tightness, tachycardia, fatigue, moist skin, and anxiety. An acute asthmatic attack is usually treated by giving an inhaled uh, albuterol to help relax the smooth muscle in the bronchioles and open up the airway so it's a vasodilator that mimics the sympathetic nerve stimulation. Long-term therapy of asthma uh, usually will try to work to suppress the underlying inflammation by the use of corticosteroids. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD is a type of respiratory disorder it's characterized by chronic and recurrent obstruction of the airflow. Um, COPD affects about 30 million Americans, and it's the fourth leading cause of death behind heart disease, cancer, and cerebrovascular disease. The principal types of COPD are emphysema and chronic bronchitis. In most cases, COPD is preventable because its most common cause is cigarette smoking or breathing secondhand smoke. Other causes include air con uh, I'm sorry, air pollution, pulmonary infection, or occupational exposure to dust, gases, and other genetic factors. So let's look at the two primary types of COPD. Emphysema is characterized by destruction of the walls of the alveoli, and that leads to abnormally large air spaces that remain filled with air even during exhalation. So with less surface area for gas exchange, O2 diffusion across the respiratory membrane is reduced. Blood oxygen levels tend to be somewhat lower, and any type of exercise that raises oxygen requirements can leave the person that has emphysema basically breathless. As increasing numbers of the alveolar walls are damaged, lung elastic recoil decreases because of the loss of elastic fibers, and increasing amounts of air become trapped in the lungs. Over several years, the added exertion that's needed during inhalation increases the size of the chest and sometimes results in what's called barrel chest. So emphysema is generally characterized by or generally caused by long-term irritation, cigarette smoke, air pollution, occupational exposure. Treatment consists of stopping exposure, stop smoking, remove the other environmental irritants, or exercise training under careful adult or careful medical supervision, uh, which can include breathing exercises and the use of bronchodilators and oxygen therapy. 
Chronic bronchitis is a disorder that's characterized by secretion of bronchial mucus accompanied by a productive cough. So sputum is raised. You cough and something comes up, right? So you can spit it out. Uh, it's chronic if it has lasted over a period um, of three months of the year for two or more successive years. So cigarette smoking is the primary cause of chronic bronchitis. Inhaled irritants lead to chronic inflammation and with an increase in the size and number of mucus glands and goblet cells in the airway epithelium, producing more and more and more mucus, therefore more and more and more to be coughed up. So the thickened and excessive mucus narrows the passageways and impairs the function of the cilia on those pseudostratified columnar epithelial cells. So the inhaled pathogens that we all are breathing in all the time get embedded in the airways, and once they're there, they can start to, to rapidly multiply. But besides the productive cough, the symptoms of chronic bronchitis often include shortness of breath, wheezing, cyanosis, and pulmonary hypertension. Treatment for it? Similar to that for emphysema. Breathing exercises, exercise treatment, bronchodilators, and oxygen therapy. In the United States, lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer death in both males and females. At the time of diagnosis, lung cancer is usually very far ex uh, advanced, and metastases are present in well over 50% of the patients. Most people with lung cancer die within a year of being diagnosed, and the overall survival rate is only 10 to 15 percent. Cigarette smoke is the most common cause of lung cancer. About 85 percent of lung cancers are smoking-related, and the disease is 10 to 30 times more common in smokers than non-smokers. Exposure to secondhand smoke is also associated with lung cancer and heart disease. In the United States alone, secondhand smoke causes an estimated 4,000 deaths a year from lung cancer and nearly 40,000 deaths a year from heart disease. Other causes of lung cancer are ionizing radiation and inhaled irritants, such as asbestosis and radon gas. Emphysema is often a precursor, though, to the development of lung cancer. Symptoms of the cancer are related to the location of the tumor, and they can include a chronic cough or spitting blood from the respiratory tract, wheezing, shortness of breath, chest pain, difficulty swallowing, weight loss, anorexia, fatigue, bone loss, problems with balance, headache, anemia, jaundice. Treatment consists of partial or complete surgical removal of the diseased lung that's known as a pulmonectomy, radiation therapy, and chemotherapy. And, of course, as we mentioned at the beginning of this, treatment is usually not successful with an overall survival rate of only 10 to 15 percent. Malignant mesothelioma is a rare form of cancer that affects the simple serous membrane. The most common form of the disease, which is about 75 percent of all cases, affects the pleura of the lungs. But there are also peritoneal mesothelioma, pericardial mesothelioma, and testicular mesothelioma. Somewhere between two and 3,000 cases of malignant melanoma are diagnosed each year in the United States. That accounts for about 3% of all cancers. The disease is almost entirely caused by exposure to asbestos, or to asbestos which has been widely used in industry, in uh, roof shingles and textiles and insulation and floor products. Signs and symptoms of malignant mesothelioma may not even appear until somewhere between 20 and 50 years after the exposure. When you're, we're looking at pleural mesothelioma, the signs and symptoms include chest pain, shortness of breath, pleural effusion, anemia, blood when you cough it up, wheezing, hoarseness, and unexplained weight loss. There is usually no cure for malignant mesothelioma unless the tumor is found very, very early and it can be completely surgically removed before metastasis. However, the prognosis is poor because it's usually diagnosed in its later stages after the symptoms have appeared. Chemotherapy, radiation, and immunotherapy uh, can be used to help decrease the symptoms, but again, very, very rarely is there a cure. Pneumonia is an acute infection or inflammation of the alveoli. 
There are microbes that enter the lungs and they release damaging toxins that stimulates an inflammatory and immune response that have damaging side effects. The toxins and the immune response damage the alveoli and the bronchial mucous membranes. Inflammation and edema cause alveoli to fill with fluid, interfering with ventilation and gas exchange. The most common cause of pneumonia is a bacteria called Streptococcus pneumoniae, but other microbes can also cause pneumonia. For those uh, who are most susceptible to pneumonia are the elderly, infants, and people that are already immunocompromised or taking immunosuppressive drugs. However, cigarette smokers or individuals with obstructive lung disease are also at higher risk for developing pneumonia. Most cases are preceded by a, an upper respiratory tract infection that usually is viral. Individuals then develop fever, cough, chills, chest pains, sometimes spitting up blood as well. Treatment uh, most often involves antibiotics and bronchiodilators, oxygen therapy, and increased fluid intake. Tuberculosis is called by, caused by a bacterium and it produces an infectious communicable disease called tuberculosis that often affects the lungs and the pleura of the lungs but can also affect other body areas. So once the bacteria are inside the lungs, they multiply and that causes an inflammatory response. That inflammatory response stimulates neutrophils and macrophages to migrate to the lungs to engulf the bacteria. If the immune system is not impaired, the bacteria can remain dormant for life, but impaired immunity can lead to the bacteria escaping into the blood and lymphatic systems where it can infect other organs. In many people, the symptoms, fatigue, weight loss, anorexia, low-grade fever, night sweats, may not develop until the disease has advanced. Pulmonary edema is an abnormal accumulation of fluids in the interstitial spaces in the alveoli of the lungs. And it can arise from increased permeability of the pulmonary capillaries or increased pressure of the pulmonary capillaries. And this can coincide with congestive heart failure. The most common symptom is dys dyspnea. I don't know why I have so much trouble with that. Or breathing that is ineffective or, ineffective or changed. Uh, other symptoms include wheezing, rapid breathing, restlessness, feeling of suffocation, cyanosis, uh, pulmonary hypertension. Treatment consists of giving oxygen and drugs that dilate the bronchioles and lower the blood pressure. Diuretics can also be useful in helping to rid the body of excess fluid and drugs that can correct acid-base imbalance, suctioning airways and mechanical ventilation. We've already talked about the common cold uh, back earlier in a previous video, so we'll not look at that one now. Uh, but I do want to talk just briefly about sudden infant death syndrome, or what we commonly call SIDS. So it's sudden unexpected death of an, an infant that dies during their sleep, but was apparently healthy. So it rarely occurs before two weeks or after six months of age, with the peak time being between the second and fourth months. SID is more common in premature infants, males, low birth weight babies, babies of drug users or smokers, babies who have stopped breathing and have had to be resuscitated, or babies with upper respiratory tract infections. It's also more common in babies that have had a sibling die from SIDS as well, but the exact cause is not really known. It may be due to an abnormality in the mechanisms that control the, respira the uh, respirations or low levels of oxygen in the blood. SIDS could also be linked to hypoxia while sleeping in a prone position or on the stomach or rebreathing exhaled air that gets trapped in the depression of a mattress. So it's recommended that for, for the, fourth, the first six months that infants be placed on their backs for sleeping. And then finally, uh, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, or SARS, is an example of an emerging infectious disease. So it's new or changing. Other examples of emerging infectious disease are the West Nile encephalitis, mad cow disease, and AIDS. SARS first appeared in southern China in 2002 and has since spread world worldwide. It's a respiratory illness contained by or I'm sorry, it's a respiratory illness 
that's caused by a new variety of coronavirus, and the symptoms include fever, muscle aches, non-productive cough, difficulty breathing, sometimes headache, chills, and diarrhea as well. Some cases require mechanical ventilation, and some cases result in death. It's primarily spread from person to person through contact, and there's no effective treatment for SARS, and the death rate is usually about uh, 5 to 10 percent among elderly and people that have other uh, medical underlying issues. And then the last thing that we'll look at will be, uh, I'm sorry, we'll look at smoking and the respiratory system, and then we'll back up and look at the focus on homeostasis. So smoking can cause a person to become easily winded even during very moderate exercise because of several factors that decrease respiratory efficiency. One is that nicotine constricts terminal bronchioles, which decreases airflow in and out of the lungs. Two, carbon monoxide in cigarette smoke binds to hemoglobin with a much higher affinity than oxygen does, so it reduces the oxygen carrying capacity. Three, Irritants in cigarette smoke cause increased mucus secretion. Once you have increased mucus secretion and swelling of the mucus lining, that's going to impede airflow in and out of the lungs. Four, irritants in cigarette smoke also inhibit the movement of the cilia and destroy cilia in the lining of the respiratory tract. So the mucus builds up in the respiratory tract and can cause those forceful um, coughs that can lead to rupturing of the alveolar sacs. The irritants can convert the normal respiratory epithelium into stratified squamous epithelial, so layers and layers and layers of squamous epithelial cells that lack cilia and goblet cells. And five, with time, smoking leads to the destruction of the elastic fibers in the lungs and is the primary cause of emphysema, which we talked about earlier. These changes cause collapse of the small bronchioles and trap air in the alveoli at the end of exhaling. So the result is less efficient gas exchange. If you need another reason to stop smoking, go back over this video. And then look at this picture. You have healthy lungs versus diseased lungs of a smoker. The chemicals, the tar, build up in the lungs and create this dark tissue. One of the most amazing things I saw during my cadaver dissections was to do a comparison of healthy versus non-healthy lungs. And then I would be remiss if I didn't mention vaping because this is something that is emerging in the world today. Vaping, of course, is uh, using the electronic delivery system to um, to get the nicotine, to get the chemicals that are including in, included in the vaping liquids. So at first everyone thought these were non-harmful and now we've had several deaths that have been associated with vaping. Uh, studies are still ongoing looking at what exactly is happening with this, but you are taking chemicals that don't belong in your body into your respiratory system. Your respiratory system is responsible for your gas exchange. These chemicals build up in the lungs and as I mentioned, many studies are ongoing to look at uh, long-term effects of this, but most of the people that have had issues and have been diagnosed with these vaping respiratory diseases have been very, very young with the average age of 19. Something to think about, guys. And then finally, the focus on homeostasis. As always, I want you to look at the system that we are studying and how it plays a role with most all of our other body systems. For instance, the urinary system, together with the respiratory system, helps to regulate or regulates body fluid pH. The cardiovascular system and the respiratory system work together to deliver gases to body tissues, to take oxygen out to body tissues, and of course to take CO2 out to the lungs. The respiratory pump helps to move venous blood back to the heart. The lungs play a role in the respiratory system by converting uh, angiotensin II to, conv to angiotensin I. Uh, so again, look through all of these when you see the homeostasis at the end and understand how these systems work together.